All righty, everybody. It's so nice to see you all from co coming from all across the country. We're really excited. Um, my name is Taylor and I wanted to just welcome everybody and thank you all for joining our webinar today. Um, I am a curriculum design and training specialist here at Arizona State University Office of Community Health Engagement and Resiliency. Uh, we go by OCHER for short. Uh, so our goal here at OCHER is to co-create interventions with communities that focus on inherent strengths and assets that promote resiliency, uh, especially with underserved communities of color. So our center is funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and uh, we provide national support and technical assistance on evidence-based trauma-informed practices and interventions specifically for community health workers. Uh, so we are what we they call a category two treatment and services adaptation site, and we are part of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Um, so that just means that we provide indirect services like workforce development and enrichment opportunities for CHWs that reduce the impact of stress and trauma on children and families. And so today we are excited to um, have a presentation uh, on navigating grief and the role of community health workers, which will be presented by Maureen Burns. Um, and before we get started and I introduce Maureen, I wanted to just go over a few housekeeping um, things before we get started. So if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please type those into the question box, which you'll find on your Zoom control panel at the bottom of the screen. Um, we will make sure we get all of your questions asked and we will have time for question and answers at the end of the session. Um, for any other comments, please feel free to use the chat feature. We have some of us on the ASU team that will be um, monitoring chat and uh, we also do have live uh, Spanish language interpretation, and that is brought to you by the Tucson Language Justice Collective and our two amazing interpreters, Natalia and Maria. So we want to shout them out and say thank you. Um, and if you do want to use the Spanish channel, please go ahead and click on the interpretation button on the bottom of this, the control panel at the bottom of your screen, and then you can collect, um, select Spanish. So without further ado, um, I want to introduce our presenter, Maureen Burns. So Maureen is a community health worker and promotora de salud and a research liaison with the HAP Foundation. The HAP Foundation is a nonprofit leader with a refined focus to elevate access to and increase understanding of serious illness and hospice and palliative care through community and clinical education, workforce development, research, and advocacy. Maureen works in and around Chicago providing free community education and linking patients and loved ones to resources within their community. She has over 15 years of experience working in healthcare and a Bachelor of Arts degree in community health, culture, and aging. She is currently a graduate student pursuing her Master's of Public Health and like many people, grief has been a significant part of Maureen's life. She aims to use her own experiences, both personal and professional, to start conversations about honoring and integrating grief into our lives. So thank you, Maureen, for joining us, and I am going to pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Taylor. Um, and thank you everyone that's taken some time out of their day to be with us today. I'm really excited to be speaking to you all about this important topic. Um, so as mentioned, we're going to be talking about navigating grief and specifically the role of community health workers. Um, 
So as stated, my name is Maureen. My pronouns are she, her, or ella in Spanish. Um, and I'm a community health worker with the Hat Foundation. Um, so I just wanna start by acknowledging um, that it can be hard to discuss grief. It's not always easy. It's something that I feel is very valuable, um, but I acknowledge that we're all in different places and it can be tough to talk about and listen to. Um, so I wanna thank you for being here and being willing to engage in these discussions. Um, I also wanna acknowledge that as we talk about grief and loss, it could bring up difficult emotions um, for different people. We're all impacted by grief and loss, um, but in different ways. Um, so I just want to remind everyone to prioritize their well-being. Um, and if you feel activated or if you feel upset and you need to step away, that is okay. Um, also, please, you know, utilize the chat if you would like to share um, feelings that you're having or share comments or experiences. Um, and so having said that, that this can be difficult to discuss um, and to hear about, I just want to offer a resiliency pause and offer a skill that might be helpful um, if during the discussion, hearing about grief and loss um, affects you in an emotional way or affects your nervous system, um, consider thinking about a resource. So a resource is any person, place, thing, memory, or part of yourself that brings you joy that makes you happy, makes you feel calm, pleasant, strong, resilient. Um, so that might be pausing to pet your dog. That might be stopping this Zoom call to um, listen to a song or looking at a photograph or call a friend. Um, resources can be real or imagined, internal or external. Um, and I think they're a really great tool um, if any of today's content is hard for you or is activating. So I just want to offer that as an option and a tool. Um, I did want to say just a little bit more about my organization, the Hat Foundation. We are a nonprofit um, in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and as mentioned, we work to expand access to and understanding of serious illness. Um, so I am part of the community education team, and I do that just by doing what I'm doing today, right? Talking to community members, talking to people about um, topics that touch on serious illness. So in addition to talking about grief and loss, I also lead workshops about advanced directives, about hospice and palliative care, about caregiving, and about the community resiliency model, CRIM. Um, so as I said, I live and work in Chicago, Illinois, and I know many of you are joining um, from all over, and that's super exciting. A large part of my job um, is talking to people and explaining topics that pertain to serious illness or end of life. I always like to let people know that I am not a clinician. I am not a grief counselor. Um, however, grief is a human experience. Um, we all experience grief, and as such, we all bring our unique perspectives and experiences. Um, so that's what I try and do. I try and research, um, you know, best practices and grief support, but then also bring my experiences that I've had when I have lost people and I have grieved. Um, also my experiences as a parent um, guiding my daughter through her grief. Um, we lost her father when she was about 10 years old. So I have that experience as well. And then because I work for the HAP Foundation, um, which is focused on serious illness and end of life care, I also have that sort of professional exposure to grief and loss. Um, so that's just a little bit of context. Um, and so many of you on the call may be CHWs or Promotoras de Salud or CHRs or other sort of people working in outreach and health navigation. Um, I wanna tell you just a little bit more about my role with the HAP Foundation. Um, my role is really designed to help eliminate barriers to care, um, to make sure that folks understand what um, supportive care is out there for serious illnesses, things like hospice and palliative care, um, but also to make sure that I'm providing that education 
in a way that's respectful of people's culture, religion, and lived experiences. Um, and then in addition to community education, like I'm doing today, um, I also do some resource navigation. So connecting folks with resources, whether that's finding care providers or finding a support group or a food pantry or pretty much anything that someone might need. Um, so because of my role at the Hat Foundation and our focus on end of life care, I have a little bit more training and exposure to grief support than other community health workers might. However, I think this is so important that you're all here today and that we're talking about this because we know that community health workers are trusted sources of information and support. Um, and as human beings, community health workers inevitably will have their own grief experiences. Um, so part of the goal of this presentation is really to empower you all to best support yourselves if you're going through grief and also how to talk to community members and clients and support people who may be grieving. So in terms of the presentation, I'm gonna start by defining some key turn terms. I'm also gonna discuss some different categories of grief, myths about grief and loss, um, some of the symptoms that people experience when they're grieving, and then some tools for coping with grief, um, suggestions for how to support people as they grieve, and then talk a little bit about grief-informed care and our role as community health workers um, in supporting grieving people. And then as mentioned at the end, we'll have time um, for a Q&A. So in terms of some of the vocabulary uh, that we need to kind of understand for today's presentation, grief is the reaction to a loss. It's the aftermath consisting of a wide spectrum of emotions and deep sadness. Now, a loss can be many things, right? We tend to think of a loss as a death, um, and that is definitely um, a huge type of loss. And I'd say most of my presentation is going to focus on losses that are deaths. However, that's not the only type of loss, right? And we're going to talk in a little bit um, about some of the other types of loss that, although they are not deaths, um, can be just as serious, just as hurtful, um, and have, you know, grief journeys that go along with them. Um, and then mourning, so you may hear people talk about, you know, they are mourning. Um, that is the outward and sort of social expression of a loss, um, and it often includes things like rituals and traditions. And then finally, bereavement is a deep sorrow experienced at the loss of a loved one. So bereavement is another word for grief, but it's also specific to grieving a death as opposed to other types of losses. So as I said before, um, any loss can cause grief. Um, and some examples, obviously death of someone that we care about, also um, a divorce or a breakup of a relationship, whether that's a romantic relationship or a friendship. Another big one that I come across a lot is loss of independence. Um, so when we think about people who used to be very independent, drove themselves everywhere, did everything themselves, and then maybe they have a health condition or something come up for them and they're no longer able to do all those independent activities and now they need some help. Um, that is a loss. During the pandemic, um, you know, in addition to deaths from COVID, we also had a loss of social, social interaction, right? Um, where we didn't get to see and interact with people in the same ways. Or if we did, maybe we didn't feel the same sense of safety. Um, Additionally, uh, miscarriage, stillbirth, stillbirth, or abortion are also types of losses. Um, loss of homeland or culture shock. Um, you know, I have some members of my community who are recent refugees, and that culture shock and that kind of loss of their 
community in their home country um, is definitely a big loss that people inevitably grieve. Also loss of peace, loss of safety and security, um, loss of a pet, loss of a job or financial stability. There's really so, so many examples of losses that we all experience. Um, so I wanna take a moment um, and just reflect on that. Again, this is an invitation. No one um, is forced to share, but if anyone would like to reflect um, to themselves about losses that they've experienced and just kind of think about that. And if you want to um, share any examples in the chat, please feel free to do that. Um, and I think we'll we'll go back to the chat at the end. But I think it's important to note that loss is universal, right? We will all experience losses, but that doesn't mean that we have identical experiences, right? There's a universal thread, but we, we experience these things individually in different ways. And that touches on kind of what I like to call the grief paradox, which is grief touches everyone. When we, we just talked about all these different types of losses that are not deaths, but even just looking at deaths, 2.6 million deaths every year. Um, and you think about all of those people when they die, how many loved ones and friends they're leaving behind. Um, it adds up to nearly 14 million grievers each year um, just from deaths. So that touches all of us. Um, so why don't we talk more about something that affects all of us so much? Um, and I think the answer to that is because grief is scary. It reminds us of our own mortality, our own vulnerabil vulnerability. And it reminds us that life is short and unpredictable. Um, we don't have a lot of places in our society, at least in American society, outside of religious or cultural contexts. Um, we don't have a lot of places to honor grief, to discuss grief. No one outside of potentially maybe our loved ones, our family members, prepares us for grief. No one educates us on how to cope. Um, and so there is a good deal of stigma associated with death and grief. Um, and also, you know, there is no roadmap, right? It can be hard to educate people about something that's so unique and unpredictable. Um, we can't map out grief. We cannot write a how-to book, but we as people, um, as parents, as friends, as community health workers, we can and we should engage in conversations about grief um, because grief matters. And you can see in the picture here, um, the woman is saying, I'm so sorry, there are no words. And the man is saying, actually, there are lots. We just need to start using them. So that's the kind of the point of this is there is a silence that exists around grief for many reasons, right? Stigma, fear, people not knowing what to say, being afraid of saying the wrong things. Um, so I just wanna acknowledge that. And part of, part of the point of today's presentation um, is to kind of engage in those conversations. So I like this quote, there are no quick fixes to grief, no easy answers, but every expression of grief that wants to be felt and honored and given its space must be allowed in order to heal. Um, so I think that just really speaks to how powerful and how unique um, grief is. I also wanna acknowledge that grief is normal, right? Grief is not a mental disorder. Um, inevitably, if we experience love, we will experience grief. Um, and it's normal to grieve and to experience physical, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral reactions. Um, and we don't get over grief, right? When someone dies, 
It's not like we grieve for a few months and then boom, we're fine and we get over that loss. No, that loss was enormous. It was life-changing. Um, so we don't get over it, but we learn how to integrate the grief into our lives um, and how to continue to live in a new reality uh, where that person that we lost is no longer on earth with us and our relationship with them continues, but it is a different relationship. Um, so many people who grieve report crying, longing, having dreams of loved ones, anger, denial, sadness, insomnia, fatigue, um, a loss of interest, feelings of guilt, disbelief, um, an inability to concentrate, preoccupation with thoughts of your loved ones, numbness or the flip side, you know, overreacting and being really reactive. Sometimes people experience relief um, after a death, especially if the person was suffering. Sadness, yearning, fear, shame, loneliness, and helplessness are all examples of some, just some of the things that we may encounter when we are grieving. And this is another quote, this is a piece of grief poetry um, that I really love because I think it illustrates um, how all encompassing grief can be and how it continues uh, throughout time. So it says, I miss you when something really good happens because you're the one I wanna share it with. I miss you when something is troubling me because you're the only one who understands me so well. I miss you when I laugh and cry because I know that you're the one who makes my laughter grow and my tears disappear. I miss you all the time, but I miss you the most when I lie awake at night and think of all the wonderful times we spent with each other. For those were some of the best memorable times of my life. So I think that really illustrates um, grief is so hard because um, of the relationships that we have, right? And then the love that we have for people. Um, so we have the, these great moments in our lives, these great relationships in our lives. And then when someone dies, um, it's so hard to deal with that, to cope with that. Um, and it can be overwhelming and it can also be isolating, especially when you think about how hard it can be for people to talk about grief or to support someone who's grieving. Um, many people who are grieving report feeling abandoned by kind of their social circle, their social circle or their supportive network. So I am gonna talk about a few categories of grief. Um, keep in mind that Although there are categories, just because two people have the same category of grief does not mean that they will exhibit it identically, right? We are individuals and we all have different manifestations. Um, some people, including myself, question how helpful it is to categorize grief because grief is always unique. Um, but I did wanna talk about a few types that you may hear about, um, especially in a clinical setting. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is what we call anticipatory grief. And this comes up a lot um, in hospice care or in other situations where people are experiencing an extended prolonged long-term illness. So this is grief before the loss. Um, so this happens when people might have a serious illness um, and as they are declining and the illness is progressing, um, their loved ones may begin to grieve even before they, they die. So the person is still there, but the loved one knows that this is coming, right? And so they, they may start to grieve, to grieve already. And that's called anticipatory grief. Um, this can be really confusing for people um, because people might feel like guilty, like, oh my gosh, I'm crying and grieving and you're sitting here right next to me. Like, shouldn't I be making the most of the time with you rather than, you know, crying my eyes out? So people um, may experience anger, 
relationships, loss of emotional control, and above all, a sense of helplessness, right? Because it's so hard when you know that something is coming, um, but you can't do anything to stop it. Um, and it's also important to note, especially when we talk about different types of relationships, we may um, be grieving the person that we're going to lose, but then we also might be grieving other things. You know, if you think about maybe a couple, a young couple, and the husband is dying, and the wife may be experiencing anticipatory grief at the loss of her husband, but then she might also be grieving other things, you know, dreams or plans they had in the future um, that she knows are no longer going to happen uh, because of the husband's illness. So that is anticipatory grief. Um, it is completely normal, like all types of grief, um, but it can be really confusing when people um, start to experience that. This next category, I want to preface it by saying that this is a clinical label, complicated grief, um, and it's used by some bereavement counselors. Um, I present this category because I want you, you may hear the term and I want you to be familiar with it, um, but there's some disagreement. You know, many people think this category is harmful because all grief is complicated right? Uh, we are individuals and grief is complex. Um, but nevertheless, you may hear clinicians discuss complicated grief, um, chronic grief, delayed grief, distorted grief, all kind of fall under this blanket term of complicated grief. And what it means um, is it's a type of grief that can be really hard to integrate. As I said, we never get over grief, but we work to heal and integrate the grief into our lives. Um, and when people have really debilitating grief reactions um, where they feel like they're really unable to resume their lives, uh, this is usually referred to as complicated grief. Um, and again, it depends on the individual, but many people um, who experience these symptoms may seek you know, help from a bereavement counselor, a grief counselor. The next category um, is a really tough category called disenfranchised grief. Um, this is really, really harmful. Basically what happens here is someone is grieving and the usual group of people that would be supporting them in their grief um, does not support them and instead offers judgment. Um, this happens sometimes due to circumstances around a death. If a death is highly stigmatized, um, so maybe someone dies in a drunk driving accident and they are the drunk driver. Um, and so the family of that person, when they reach out for support, they might get judgment. They might hear people you know, not offering support and instead giving their opinions about why was that person driving intoxicated. Um, another example here in Chicago, a while back, we had an instance of the police uh, murdering a young boy, Adam Toledo. And there was a lot of um, talk on social media where people were asking, you know, um, I believe he was 13 years old and people were like, why was this 13 year old even out at night? Like, how could his mother let him out? You can imagine how damaging that is for a mother who's grieving her child. Um, and instead of support and condolences, she's getting judgment. Um, this has also come up sometimes in the context of COVID. Um, you know, people who have lost loved ones to COVID report that sometimes when they say, oh, my mom died from COVID, the first thing that people respond with is not, I'm so sorry, it's, was she vaccinated? Um, and, you know, regardless of people's intentions, um, it implies somehow that if she wasn't vaccinated, um, that she deserved it. So as you can see, this type of grief is extremely isolating 
um, because those same people that we usually rely on for support or at least understanding and love, um, they withhold that support. Um, so it's very difficult to go through disenfranchised grief. A couple other categories, because there are quite a few. Um, collective grief is exactly what it sounds like. It's grief that's felt by a collective group. Um, so you think about maybe some grief that people experienced after 9-11 or after Hurricane Katrina. Um, also grief after a natural disaster um, or a war, any sort of mass event um, can lead to feelings of collective grief. Traumatic grief, um, again, I'll say this has a little bit of a caveat. Any type of grief could be experienced as traumatic grief, right? If it is traumatic to you, it's traumatic. Um, but this is usually used to describe situations where there's um, a death and grief, but then also some sort of um, trauma going along with that. So maybe you lose a loved one to gun violence and you witness it, you are there. So you are not only someone who is grieving your loved one, you're also dealing with that traumatic experience of gun violence. And then inhibited grief um, is what they call it when someone is not really showing many signs, at least outward signs of grief uh, for an extended period of time. Again, we wanna acknowledge that each of us will deal with grief differently. And some people are more introverted and private than others. Um, but obviously the concern here is if people are holding in grief or don't have outlets to talk about it or deal with it, work to integrate it, um, then that might lead to physical manifestations and what we call somatic complaints. So, you know, a lot of sort of like stomach aches, migraines, headaches, um, and the root cause is kind of that grief. So now quickly, I'm gonna go over some myths and facts. A myth about grief is that it has a predictable pattern. This is false. Grief is like a roller coaster ride with no timeline. Another myth is that grief ends at a certain point or will end over time. This is also false. Grief changes, it can be integrated into our lives, but it doesn't go away. Um, we consider healing to be occurring when the pain is less and when you have room for other things besides only grief. Um, another really damaging myth is that the pain will go away if you just ignore it. So kind of what I mentioned with inhibited grief. Um, trying to ignore grief or keep it from surfacing will usually make it worse in the long run. Um, and it's okay to face your grief, actively deal with it, and communicate your needs. Another myth is that part of grieving is bringing closure to that relationship. Um, it's really important to understand that your relationship with that person continues. It's just different. It's now in memories and traditions and perhaps spiritual. Um, but, you know, if you lose your dad, your dad is still your dad. And he's still an important part of your life, even if he has died. Um, this myth is very damaging that it's important to be strong in the face of a loss. Um, this comes up a lot, especially with parents and specifically, I think sometimes men. Crying doesn't make you weak. Grieving doesn't make you weak. This is a normal reaction to a loss. And a lot of times parents specifically feel they need to put up a brave face and be a rock for their children. Um, but I actually believe the opposite. Um, you know, when I was grieving and my daughter was grieving the loss of her father, um, it was really important to model for her. Um, you know, I would break down and cry and she would see that it's okay to break down and cry. Um, so it's important that we don't put up this this tough facade because children may mirror that and feel like it's not okay for them to talk about their grief or experience, you know, feelings of sadness. 
some of you may have heard of the five stages of coping with a death. I feel like this was a common theme on different sitcoms when I was growing up and I would watch TV um, and people would go through these stages in a nice neat list. Um, these stages, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance um, were introduced by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in 1969. Um, and there has been criticism about, you know, how helpful it is to name these stages, but she always insisted um, that these stages were not meant to be a rigid framework. These were things she heard from people she interviewed who were grieving. Um, so it's important to understand that you might experience some of these, all of these, um, but we can't tuck messy emotions into neat packages. Um, and there might be other things that we might add to this list, um, such as guilt. Guilt is a very common um, reaction to a death or a loss. So I present these, um, you know, because a lot of people go through them, um, but I just want to make clear that, you know, we can't put our grief into these nice, neat boxes. It doesn't play out in a 30 minute sitcom on TV. You know, life is messy and, messy and life is complex. Um, and so I think this image kind of illustrates that, um, you know, that in reality, things are not neat. Grief is a roller coaster. So while understanding stages or common symptoms might be helpful, just remember that grief is unique. It varies according to the individual and their experiences. Grief is not linear and it is not predictable. Part of what makes it so hard and so scary. Um, but having said that, people who are grieving may experience physical symptoms, such as disturbances in sleep, uh, physical distress, feeling sick, changes in weight. Emotional symptoms, obviously sadness, anxiety, loneliness, anger. And then behaviorally, um, you might find yourself having a hard time focusing, forgetting things, being more worried, or withdrawing from normal activities. So how do we take care of ourselves when we are grieving? Obviously the answer to that question is gonna be different for each of us, um, but we do recommend that people don't push those feelings down. Don't ignore your feelings. You are grieving a meaningful relationship and those feelings are valid. Um, so when possible, create places where you can honor your losses. You think about it, you know, other than funerals or memorial services, we don't have a lot of um, dedicated spaces in society to honor our losses. Um, so however you do that, um, find a way to do that, find a ritual. One thing that I like to do um, with people that I've lost that I love is to remember things that they used to say. You know, my dad used to make certain jokes or comments or catchphrases. Um, and I've started, you know, saying those, kind of working those words into my vocabulary. It reminds me of the person and it's kind of like a way that they live on in my life. So that's just one example. It can also be helpful to find a tangible way to express your feelings whether that's journaling, writing the person a letter with the things you never got to say. Um, could also be spiritual, you know, praying or using affirmations of your faith. It can be helpful to try and maintain hobbies and interests, things that can bring you joy amidst the grief. Also can be helpful to plan for what we call grief triggers. So anniversaries or holidays or milestones um, can reawaken feelings of grief um, and they can make them, you know, they can magnify them. So it's important to plan for that and to give yourself permission to feel whatever you're feeling. Um, don't let people tell you how to feel and don't try to avoid telling yourself how you should be feeling. Um, acknowledge that 
when someone dies, that's a life altering change. Um, and we need to give ourselves grace. So a few more um, tips for coping, you know, try and um, be in the present moment, enjoy the present, try and create opportunities when you can connect with others, whether that is being with your loved ones and your friends, or whether that is like in the context of grief, like a support group or something of that nature. Um, work on creating memories with the people that you love, um, develop rituals as we talked about, and ask for help um, when you need it, whether that's from friends or family members or a counselor or a support group. Um, really trying to take life one step at a time and realizing that you may need different things at different moments, and that's okay. Um, so it can be really hard for some of us when we are seeking to support someone we love who's grieving. Um, people need different types of support depending on their personality, on the loss they've experienced, and also on their relationship with you, the person who may be offering support. So this gets very tricky. And sometimes, you know, people don't know what to say. So they don't say anything, or maybe they say something and it comes across wrong. Um, so you can see on the screen, this was from a survey, uh, do's and don'ts. I am guilty myself of my personality is kind of like a problem solver. Um, so I always want to like do something to ease the pain. But you really need to look at grief. Uh, you can't take away someone's grief. And you shouldn't aim to minimize it or to search for silver lining. Um, your goal should really just be to offer love and support. Um, so hold space for people's pain, allow their pain to exist and really actively listen to them and validate their thoughts and emotions. Um, you don't wanna push someone towards feeling better. Um, but rather you wanna allow them to grieve in a way that feels natural. So how do we do this, right? It's important to take time to listen to people um, and rather than to try and solve their grief problem, um, to let them know that you are there, that you hear them, that you love them, and you wanna be a positive, supportive force in their life. Um, another thing is that, you know, it's very common when you're grieving to hear over and over and over again, please let me know if you need anything. And people say this, it's well-intentioned, um, but when you think about it, it kind of places a demand on the grieving person, right? Because now you're asking them to identify what they need and then reach out to you and ask for it. Um, and many of us, when we're grieving, we're not even able to verbalize what we need, um, let alone to go out and ask someone for it. Um, so if you are supporting a friend or loved one and you feel like you need to do something tangible to help, um, think of something that you can do. You know, think about cooking someone a meal and dropping it off, sending them a gift card, that they can buy a meal with, um, mailing a condolence letter. Think of something, no matter how big or small, that you can offer and just offer it. It's also really important to try and be intentional with your words. So this slide has some more do's and don'ts. I think it's important. Um, we want to express empathy and it's kind of human nature that when someone is grieving, we kind of go back to our own experiences with grief. Um, but you wanna acknowledge that what you went through grieving is not gonna be identical to what that person is going through grieving. Um, and the way that you view a loss may differ from how that person views it. Um, so another common thing that people will say is like, oh, he or she is with the angels now. They're looking down on you. 
People mean this in a nice comforting way, um, but the grieving person may not believe that they're with the angels. They may not believe that they're in a better place. Um, and so just to be really intentional about your words, um, don't say, I know how you feel. Rather say something, I can't imagine how you must be feeling. I'm here, I love you. Um, don't say, you just have to be strong. It's okay to even say, you know, I don't know what to say. I'm speechless, but I love you and I want to be here for you. Um, so it, also it's important to remember relationships and boundaries. And so what I mean by that is different relationships have different parameters. Um, so when we talk about doing something tangible to help someone, you want to keep in mind boundaries. Um, so if you have a friend that you typically talk to every day and they're experiencing a loss, then I would say it's appropriate to call them every day because that kind of matches the relationship that you had. Um, but if it's someone who's more like an acquaintance um, and you feel so bad that they're grieving, it's really not appropriate for you to all of a sudden be calling them every day, right? You want your actions to be appropriate to the relationship and not cross boundaries. Um, so in that case, you know, if it's someone you don't talk to all that frequently, it might be more appropriate to call once and maybe send a card or something of that nature. Um, so just don't forget boundaries um, when thinking about how to support people. Also want to take a moment to talk about grief informed care. Many of you on the call may be familiar with trauma-informed care. Um, and grief-informed care really recognizes that loss is inevitable um, and loss is indiv individual. Um, each loss and relationship and circumstances are different. Um, so by acknowledging that grief is an individual experience, but it's also woven into our wider social context. Um, a grief informed response really says that grief is complex and you are having a normal response to a complex situation. So I will include in the slides, there's a link to click on some more information about grief informed care, but it basically has 10 principles. Uh, grief is natural, it's normal, inevitable human experience, um, non-pathological and complex. So what that means is grief is not a mental disorder, but it's very complex. Um, contextual, grief does not occur in a vacuum. It's interconnected to our communities and our social systems. Disruptive, grief challenges our identity, our relationships, our beliefs, and our assumptions about life. Um, relational connection and perceived support. This is the idea that grieving people need support, but they often feel abandoned or left behind. Personal empowerment and agency. This is the idea that death makes us feel powerless. Um, we don't have a sense of control. And so cultivate, cultivating control and empowerment can help to foster healthy adaptation after grief. Safety, um, the idea that people need a safe space physically, emotionally, and spiritually, spiritually to integrate their grief. Person-centered, this is so important that the duration, intensity, and experience of grief are unique to each individual. I think I've said that several times, but it's so important. Um, grief is not cookie cutter in any way. And then dynamic and non-finite, meaning that there are no universally acceptable or correct ways to grieve. Different things work for different people and that loss is interwoven into our identities um, and that just means that grief is ongoing. As we said, you don't get over it. It doesn't have an end date, but it changes um, as you change and as your life and relationships change. Um, and so I'll just end with this to always remember 
Um, grief is hard and it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to honor losses and give yourself a space to really feel whatever you're feeling, right? Many times when you're grieving, you may have a great day where you don't feel that grief that day. And then the next day, um, it might be all you can think about is the loss. Um, so just to give yourself that space and that grace that you're dealing with something um, really difficult. Grief is a human experience. It's not a mental illness or a disease. It's a natural human response to a loss. But having said that, we all need support. And sometimes we get that support from a faith community, our friends, our family, our community. Um, but sometimes we might want a grief counselor or a therapist or a psychologist to help us work through our grief. Um, and as we said, many times grief is a process. It changes over time. Um, and it's not always a linear process. You know, there are, there are, it's a winding journey that's kind of all over the map. It's unpredictable. I really like this quote too that says, there ain't no shame in holding on to grief as long as you make room for other things too. Um, and I think this is so true, right? Our grief doesn't go away um, and it shouldn't, right? It might get easier on some days, we might integrate it into our lives, um, but if we still have space for other relationships, if we still have space for joy and happiness, um, then we're, you know, we are healing. Um, and one of the things about grief that makes it so difficult that I think was referenced in the poem that I read is, you know, when you lose someone from then on, all those happy moments in your life, you know, successes, you always kind of are reminded that, you know, that person is not here on earth to celebrate that success. Um, so that's difficult. It can be painful, it can be hard, um, but I really think that grief is a part of our lives and we have sort of the strength and the resiliency to adapt to grief. I also just wanna um, make a note that there are many support groups for people who are grieving, virtual, in-person, some depending on the type of loss or the identity of the person. Bereavement or grief counseling is also an option that some folks might be interested in. Um, so I shared on this slide, the Social Care Network, which is a website that you can use to search for grief resources along with all different types of resources. Also wanted to highlight Missing Pieces. So Missing Pieces is one of our programs at the Hat Foundation. And in Illinois, it offers grief navigators and supportive resources for people dealing with the death of a child. <clears throat> and so finally, I just wanna, you know, kind of wrap up understanding our role as community health workers. It's really important that we understand that many of our clients, our patients, our friends, our family, the people in our community, they might be navigating all different types of losses, whether that's a death or some other type of loss. So just to be mindful of that in the same ways that we are mindful that you know people might have undergone different types of trauma in their lived experiences, be mindful that you never know where someone is in their grief journey and try and really have empathy for people. Understand that grief is a human experience that touches us all but it, it touches us in different ways. Um, and really avoid trying to fix people. Instead, listen, hold space, and offer love and support to them. Um, try and practice grief-informed care, which I talked a little bit about. These slides will be shared after the webinar, so you can definitely um, click this link to learn more about what grief-informed care is. And then really do yourself, do try and make yourself knowledgeable um, about resources in your particular community. So support groups or counseling or any other resources 
that might benefit someone who is grieving. And also keep in mind, if you are not sure what to say to someone, you know, if someone shares with you that they are grieving and you're like, okay, I need to be intentional with my words, but like, I'm afraid I'm going to say the wrong thing. Um, it never hurts to tell people that you care about them and to say, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure what to say, but I want you to know that I care about your well-being um, and I'm here. That's okay to say. Um, so just keep that in mind to honor losses, express empathy and love because we all need love and support. And then finally, um, I just, you know, want to shout out um, myself and the other CHWs at the HAP Foundation. We offer this free education, not only on grief, but on all these different topics that touch serious illness. Um, so I'll definitely share my contact information, but if you would like a similar presentation um, at your work site, at your faith community, at your school, um, at your nonprofit, feel free to reach out to me um, because I would love to work with you. So that is my contact information. It'll also be shared along with the Hat Foundation's website. And then finally, this will also be shared, but we ask that people take a minute to complete a brief and anonymous survey. Um, you can click the Survey Monkey link. You can also point your phone at the QR code. So finally, um, thank you all so much for listening, for being here, um, for being brave enough to engage in these conversations um, that grief matters and to want to learn more. So with that, I'm going to stop share. Thank you so much, Maureen. What an informative presentation on such an important topic. And it was really a great reminder just on the inevitability of loss and grief and that it really is such a unique journey for each of us. So um, we very much appreciate your time here at ASU and all of us here were um, it was really great. So we want to be able to open it up for questions um, from any of our participants. And if you do have any questions, please feel free to um, write them in the chat. And I have a question as we wait for people to um, type those up. So my question for you is, how do you feel uniquely positioned as a CHW when you're helping a family or a patient throughout their grief journey? That's a great question. Um, so I think first and foremost, um, myself as a community health worker, it's very important to me that I always, you know, maintain that trust with people in the community that they can trust me, that I may not be an expert on every single thing, but I'm always going to do my best um, to help them and to respect them. So I think that's one way is just that mutual respect. I think also, um, you know, having the experiences I've had personally and professionally with grief, I've noticed that, you know, there is good grief support out there. Um, but a lot of it is very kind of highly clinical. And so I think it's really important for us as community health workers, um, not that we can't know clinical terms, that we bring it more down to human level. Um, you know, grief is not a disease. It's a natural process. Um, and while everyone's experience is different, we as CHWs, we usually, you know, come from the communities that we serve. Um, so we may have not identical, but we may have similar lived experiences to those community members who are grieving. So we may understand, for instance, a cultural context to their grief, or we may understand that, you know, they're trying to grieve while also raising a large family and trying to pay their rent. So kind of you know, understanding those nuances of people's experience, I think makes all community health workers, not just myself, but kind of makes us uniquely placed um, to offer support that is 
you know, supportive and genuine, you know, with no sort of um, clinical agenda, but rather on a human level. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I did have another question come in through the chat. Um, so how do we balance allowing someone to grieve, um, but also not enabling any harmful behaviors that may come up when you when somebody is grieving? That's a great question, right? And I think that um, of course, we also we always have to start from a non-judgmental lens, right? I don't think that even when someone, even if someone may be engaging in a behavior that is harmful and that we don't like to see, um, I don't think that judging them for it helps, right? But as we talked about in the presentation, grief can be so scary and so disarming. Um, so people may be, you know, they may be engaging in behaviors that are not healthy um, because they don't know how to cope or because they feel abandoned or because there is no roadmap for how to deal with this. So I would really say that just as when you are supporting anyone who's grieving, you want to start from a place of love. Um, the same is true here, right? Rather than judging someone, you want to start from a place of I love you. I care about you. I care about your well-being. Um, and I know that you've, you know, been through an enormous loss. Um, and that is so difficult. And I have such compassion for you. And I can't take it away, but I would like to be here to support you. Um, and then, you know, talk about, you know, whatever behavior um, they're talking about, whether it's some sort of substance use or something else, you know, talk about why that's detrimental um, without, you know, judging them for that, without saying, you know, how could you do this? Say, you know, I'm worried because this X, Y, or Z, I'm worried that it will cause this. Um, and be prepared, you know, to try and guide them to resources, whether that's resources um, to cope with the grief or resources to cope with some sort of behavior, um, but just understanding that most of the time when people engage in these, you know, harmful behaviors, it's because they're trying to cope and they don't know, they don't have the support that they need. So really recognizing how isolating that can be um, and starting from a place of empathy and compassion. Because ultimately, you know, we can't, we can't force people to do things, but people are more likely um, to listen to us if we come from a place that's, that's non-judgmental. That's great. And I think it really reiterates the point you talked about earlier about coming into these conversations in a grief informed and trauma informed way. So very important. Thank you. Let me see. We have a couple of people in the chat. Julie mentioned, yeah, just letting them know you are there for them. Um, Marley. I teach skills in psychological recovery to resettle Afghans here in Phoenix. I have personally found it extremely difficult supporting clients who are grieving loss back in their home country. Your point on comfort versus support really hit home for me. As a fellow problem solver, coming to terms with a less is more approach has been challenging, but extremely rewarding. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I really love that comment. I can so relate. I have you know, I've had experiences where people share something, share some challenge with their grief. And it's almost like a gut reaction that like I, my instincts tell me that I need to like say something like, okay, how are we going to fix this? How are we going to flip it around and make it positive? And it's so hard to fight that instinct. Um, but I definitely, you know, I credit my daughter for teaching me that, um, both during, you know, supporting her in grief, but also just as a parent, you know, she has, she has taught me, she has said, you know, mom, I share problems with you and you immediately come and you want to fix them and you want to offer solutions, but I'm not coming to you for advice. I just want to share how I'm feeling. I just want you to hear it and receive it. Um, and I think for a lot of us, especially in helping professions, community health work, social work, um, 
we want to do something tangible to help, but there's so much value um, in listening without judgment, in listening without fixing, in listening without making it about ourselves, you know, and really holding space for people. So I can relate to how that is challenging, but I think it's definitely a worthwhile process um, to try and work on that. Perfect. Thank you so much, Maureen. And um, I don't see any other questions at this time, um, but at right now what we'll do is we actually do have two separate survey links that I'll be sending out. Um, we'll also be sending them in an email. So um, once we get this recording all completed, we'll send those out too, if you can fill them out. But we have one from Maureen at the HAP Foundation and one for us here at ASU Ocher. I just um, copy and pasted the one from Maureen. So us, we here at ASU, we really use these um, for our funders and just to um, make sure that we are providing the best services and webinars and um, so that we can just continue getting better and better um, at this. So um, the link will be posted for um, our survey too in just a second. And we really appreciate in advance those of you who take the time to fill both of these out for us. And um we will stick around for a couple more minutes if anybody has any additional questions but we really appreciate all of you coming today and we appreciate Maureen and being such a great partner to us and for um, providing us all with all this amazing information and this great presentation so thank you all for being here